I uh, thank you. I am very pleased to be here to have the opportunity to deliver the 11th annual lecture for the uh, Kennedy United States Law Institute. The Institute has indeed done important work that we all appreciate uh, over many years uh, dealing with the relationships between the two countries for economic, social, cultural, environmental issues. It's a multidisciplinary work um, that involves international and comparative law as, as well. Uh, the success of the Institute is due to the uh, dedicated service of uh, many people, including Kai Carmody, and as well including our, our friend, the late Henry King of uh, Case Western Reserve University uh, Law School in uh, Cleveland. So I am deeply honored to uh, have the chance to present this year's annual lecture. Uh, I'm speaking about uh, NAFTA and regulatory cooperation uh, in North America. Um, it's called Of Trade and Beer because I'm starting off with a case that deals with uh, beer, but we will talk about a few other things. Uh, as well. Um, I'm, I'm going to start off uh, talking about the Como case, which is the one uh, that's the subject of the piece in the Globe and Mail. And then I will talk about uh, what I call the trade model for regulatory cooperation, and I'll use the provisions <coughs> of NAFTA to deal with, with that issue. Uh, then uh, we'll look at uh, the common market model, and so there will be some references to the law of the European Union. Uh, in the next area, we'll look at what I call the regulatory model, uh, and we'll look at the Canadian Free Trade Agreement among the provinces, territories, and the federal government which went into effect this past uh, July. Then there will be some uh, tentative uh, conclusions or mostly questions dealing with uh, borders uh, at the end. Uh, my thesis is that um, regulatory cooperation is, is difficult. Uh, when we consider territoriality and the demands of uh, regulatory mandates, when we consider the dynamics of change as regulations change over time, uh, it's, it's very difficult to set up cooperative mechanisms that in fact allow um, states to work together at a detailed level. Uh, as we're proceeding through this material, you'll see the influence of, of influences of substantive goals, of uh, issues of power, of questions of procedures, burdens of proof, etc. Uh, questions of uh, pro-market deregulation or harmonization, and questions of the uh, appropriate balance and regulatory space uh, for the domestic uh, governments. Uh, I'm looking mainly at trade in goods and not services or investment. And the, uh, the, the main question here uh, is not going to be about taxes and uh, discrimination among goods, et cetera. There's lots of fascinating trade law on all of, all of those issues. Uh, the main question I'm looking at is whether or not the uh, good or the product uh, can be accepted in the country of import. Just a question of whether or not the goods can enter uh, the country of import. Uh, so it's just whether or not uh, this product is uh, harmful or otherwise not acceptable and denied 
uh, entry. So it's very basic. Uh, as the Como case is before the Supreme Court right now, also, uh, it seems to me it's worthwhile to think about our, our uh, techniques of uh, legal interpretation. How do we uh, inform the court of surrounding uh, context? Uh, the original decision, which we'll uh, discuss, uh, of the provincial court in New Brunswick used uh, an originalist approach to the uh, uh, interpretation of the constitutional section at issue. And the question is whether that's the best way uh, to deal with, with this matter. So we'll be crossing provincial borders, uh, international borders, we're talking about constitutions and public international law, and also uh, matters of interpretation. So I'm starting off then with the uh, Como case in New Brunswick. In the fall of 2012, uh, Gerard Como, uh, a resident of New Brunswick, bought uh, 15 cases of beer, two bottles of whiskey, and one bottle of liqueur in the province of Quebec and uh, brought them back home into uh, Campbellton, New Brunswick, and he was headed home to uh, Tracadie in the Acadian uh, Peninsula. Uh, he uh, paid in Quebec prices that were lower than the prices that he would have paid if he had bought from the New Brunswick provincial monopoly, the New Brunswick Liquor Corporation. When he drove back into New Brunswick, uh, his vehicle was intercepted, uh, the goods were seized, he was charged with the possession of liquor not purchased from the corporation. The amount of the fine was $292.50. And he fought the charge before first the uh, provincial court in New Brunswick, uh, which decided in his favor. Uh, Judge Leblanc of the uh, provincial court uh, decided that that section in the New Brunswick legislation was contrary to Section 121 of the Constitution Act 1867. And you can see the uh, section, all articles of the growth, produce, or manufacture of any one of the provinces shall, from and after the Union, be admitted free into each of the provinces. The um, issue was what was meant by admitted free. Uh, you may still study in constitutional law, I don't know, uh, but you may still study the uh, gold seal uh, decision. It's a fairly old one, back from, from uh, 1921. And the gold seal decision appears to have said but it, that admitted free means admitted free of duty, admitted free of customs duty, similar duties. The uh, provincial court received evidence on the meaning of the phrase at the time, the meaning of the phrase admitted free as distinct from admitted free of duty, and the uh, provincial court was convinced that in the drafting of section 121, uh, the drafters specifically used the phrase admitted free to refer to something more than just the absence of customs duties. Um, so uh, just, or Judge Leblanc, heard evidence on the historical context, on the understanding of the term uh, at, uh, at the time of Confederation. 
Uh, obviously, part of the impetus for Confederation had been a reaction to uh, U.S. abrogation of the Reciprocity Treaty, which had been in effect between the United States and Canada from 1854 to 1866, and which was credited for uh, enhancing uh, the economic position of the uh, British colonies in North America at the time. Uh, under the Reciprocity Treaty, uh, it was uh, determined that, in fact, the residents of those British colonies had uh, experienced unfettered trade, not just trade without duties, but unfettered trade. And uh, they had also experienced, um, according to the historic evi historical evidence presented to the court, uh, some frustration when the uh, U.S. side became unhappy with Britain for a number of reasons, uh, possibly having to do with um, alleged British support of the southern side in, in the Civil War. And in the 1860s, there had been a, uh, an increase in uh, border difficulties. Uh, U.S. officials would use powers of search and, and detention, would demand more paperwork, would, would have inspections, passport requirements. It was no longer unfettered free trade. There were trade barriers. So um, the uh, interpretation here is that the founders of Confederation, in fact, wanted, again, what they had previously had under the Reciprocity Treaty, unfettered free trade, this time with the British North American colonies, since they no longer had uh, the uh, American colonies. Uh, Judge LeBlanc says, I have been convinced that their intent was to replace the loss of the free trade American market with a free trade Canadian market, the strong and harmonious economic union envisaged by our fathers of confederation had to have, based, had to have been based on free trade, not on punishing internal non-tariff barriers such as had been put in place by the Americans. So Judge LeBlanc heard evidence that this wording for Section 121 was in fact taken from legislation in the British colonies at the time that uh, talked about uh, goods being admitted free from duty. Since the wording was different in Section 121, Judge LeBlanc said that that difference was intentional and this was meant to cover more than customs duty. It was meant to be unfettered free trade. Therefore, uh, the section in the New Brunswick legislation under which Mr. Como had been charged was unconstitutional and the charge against him was dismissed. As I say, this is now before the Supreme Court of Canada, and uh, we'll see um, what happens before the Supreme Court of Canada. So that gives you the uh, context for the uh, Como case. And um, we could say that this is an example of no entry of goods, uh, the federal legislation on which uh, the uh, provincial monopolies uh, depend uh, controls uh, cross-border entry. So, so this is uh, an example of no entry of goods for reasons that might have evolved over time. You know, there could have been a number of reasons for uh, um, legislation in the uh, 1920s, which is the uh, foundation of the, the uh, liquor control regime 
uh, uh, liquor control regimes across uh, Canada. There could have been reasons in the 1920s that are maybe no longer uh, public policy. The temperance movement is, of course, not as strong now as it was then, but there will be reasons of regulation, reasons of control of the sale of alcohol to minors. Certainly there are reasons of taxation, etc. Uh, so that there are public policy reasons at issue here. But this is an example of no entry of goods uh, for uh, the, the um, uh, in, a, in accordance with the decision of uh, the receiving uh, entity. Uh, I'm going to move now to uh, a general look at uh, trade and regulation. Uh, in uh, international law, countries control their own borders. They don't have to admit goods that they consider harmful. Uh, whether the goods breach, inter, inter, uh, or breach their domestic rules or not, uh, a, a potential import could be ex unacceptable for any number of reasons. It's a question of sovereignty. Country of import can simply say, we don't want that, uh, that good to enter. In trade agreements, typically, countries limit their power to refuse imports with clauses something like uh, this one, which is drawn from uh, the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade. No prohibitions or restrictions other than duties, taxes, or charges shall be instituted or maintained subject to various exceptions uh, in, uh, in the agreement. So typically there is some uh, limit on uh, absolute sovereignty uh, in a trade agreement. Uh, when we're dealing with uh, regulatory uh, differences, uh, regulations in one country uh, differ from regulations uh, in another. Uh, when we're dealing with regulatory differences, there are uh, three main ways that we can uh, deal with those in, uh, in a trade treaty. Uh, and there could be regulatory differences for all sorts of reasons. Uh, the history uh, under which the regulations were uh, produced, their context, the various domestic interests at the time, the ways of making laws and rules. Um, domestic uh, choices about the level of protection for health, security, uh, etc. The legitimate objectives chosen by sovereign governments. And regulatory differences could be large, but they might be small, however. And if they're inconsequential, uh, the question that we'll look at is whether they should uh, prevent cross-border uh, movement of goods. Uh, for uh, the first approach to regulatory differences, uh, there is nothing other than the sovereign decision of the country of import. Uh, the only obligation is that the imported goods must be treated uh, in a way that is no less favorable than the domestically produced goods. So in other words, the domestic regulations govern. Uh, and if the uh, goods meet the domestic regulations, fine, but if they don't, that's it. They, they don't have to be accepted. So uh, national treatment uh, simply relies on the domestic regulations in the country of import and says that those are the ones that apply. If we're going to consider a relationship between countries, between the uh, country of export, which I'll call the home country, and the country of import, uh, and if we're considering regulatory differences uh, in that context, 
the uh, other two approaches are, are highlighted here. Uh, it's possible that we could say, well, we'll just harmonize the regulations. Uh, and that means there's no longer a difference. So no problem. This involves a change, though, one country or the other. Uh, the third approach to regulatory differences is the one that I'll be talking about uh, mostly uh, today, and that's the question of the recognition of equivalence. The uh, products from the home country are given the right to circulate freely in the host country, although the regu regulations of the two remain the same. So this is uh, recognition of equivalence, the third possible approach. Oops. Um, just as a quick summary of NAFTA, uh, when we talk about uh, regulations for goods in NAFTA, uh, we're using two different categories. Uh, it's just different chapters in NAFTA. Uh, for measures that protect human, animal, and plant life or health, sanitary and phytosanitary measures, there's one chapter, chapter 7b. Uh, for all other standards related measures, there's another chapter, chapter 9, uh, TBT, Technical Barriers to Trade. Rules are slightly different as between the two chapters, but those are the, the two main categories. Uh, within NAFTA, uh, national treatment is one approach. Uh, also, harmonization is encouraged within NAFTA. Uh, I'm not giving you the uh, details on those, but for those uh, two chapters, uh, if the um, regulation uh, adopts uh, an international standard, then there are some presumptions in its favor. It's presumed that it meets uh, other requirements uh, in the, the chapter. It's presumed that it's not an unnecessary obstacle to trade, etc. But that's simply a presumption. Harmonization is not required. Uh, it's a presumption. Uh, and also, uh, within those two chapters, if one country alleges that another country's regulation has caused harm, and if the regulation does not uh, conform to an international standard, the uh, country of import, the host country, can be made to give reasons. So you see there are procedural approaches here. A presumption in favor of a regulation that uses an international standard and a requirement to give uh, reasons if, um, if, the, uh, uh, if there is a dispute and uh, if the uh, particular regulation does not use an international standard. Now, just before we uh, look at recognition, recognition of equivalence, uh, harmonization uh, isn't um, easy. If you think of harmonizing um, uh, a regulation among all of the uh, uh, members of NAFTA, uh, you can see that there is um, uh, encouragement here, each party should consider the relevant measures of the other parties. Now, that's hard to do. You have to find in the legislation of the other NAFTA countries what the regulation is that applies. And uh, the parties shall make compatible their standards related measures. Well, that's hard. I mean, you, you need information. Uh, and in order to uh, get information, you need to uh, consult. So uh, both the SPS chapter and the TBT chapter uh, have provisions on uh, notice and comment for the making of uh, regulations. Uh, you are supposed to give an opportunity for comment by other NAFTA parties. 
uh, capital P, that means the other NAFTA governments, but also other interested persons. That's the private sector. So the private sector, private parties, NGOs, industrial associations, whatever, throughout the whole NAFTA territory are supposed to have the opportunity uh, to comment on regulations as regulations develop. And this is not an easy thing to manage. Maybe if everything is done online, fine. But if you think of how difficult it is to comment on some highly technical regulation, maybe some groups need uh, funding, need assistance in order to be able to make an effective comment, etc. Uh, these are um, issues that come up automatically if we are thinking of the option of trying to encourage harmonization. So I'll move now to the uh, third approach in NAFTA, which is the question of equivalence. And remember, with equivalence, this is a situation where the product does not meet the rules in the country of import, but the difference is minor or is seen as still safe, and therefore the goods are permitted to circulate. You know, the lumber is still sufficiently strong, even though strength isn't measured just by thickness, but also thickness and whether there are knot holes or uh, the label isn't exactly uh, in accordance with domestic requirements, but the information is there. Uh, the chemical composition isn't exactly the same, but it's still safe, etc. That sort of decision leads to recognition of uh, equivalence. And uh, you can see in NAFTA that it's the uh, governments who have to do this. Uh, the exporting government has to demonstrate that, the, it, that its regulation uh, uh, meets the importing uh, party's appropriate level of protection. Now, this is for the health, safety, and uh, security of humans, animals, and plants. Uh, and then the importing party uh, can say that the level is not met, but has to provide written reasons. Burden of proof on the home country uh, to provide evidence, scientific evidence to demonstrate that it meets the uh, um, level of protection. And then if the host country refuses, it has to give written reasons. Same framework for all other uh, regulations. Same framework for the rest of the uh, technical barriers. It's for the uh, government of the home country to demonstrate that the regulations fulfill the legitimate objectives of the importing party. And then the host country can refuse, but if it does, it has to give written reasons. So uh, this is um, a, a procedural approach. Recognition of equivalence is possible. Uh, and there is this system set up in, uh, in NAFTA to permit it. But you can see that it's, it's not easily obtained. And the uh, legitimate objectives, um, obviously, uh, include things like uh, uh, safety, security, health, uh, and these are usually listed in, uh, in the various trade agreements, protection of the environment, public security, sustainable development, consumer protection, protection of workers, etc. You'll see that the lists can uh, differ uh, from agreement to agreement. Uh, but um, it's the burden on the home country to demonstrate that those legitimate objectives have been met. And then the host country uh, has this burden to give uh, written reasons on request if it uh, refuses to, uh, to grant uh, equivalence. Now, um, this all uh, involves government to government activity. 
right? Uh, if I want to export something to the United States and I don't quite exactly meet the uh, US requirement, um, I have to convince my government to try to uh, represent me for recognition of equivalence. And, you know, I have to be sufficiently important to, uh, to see if, if the, uh, to persuade the government to do that. It's, it's going to take a bit to do that. And the, the questions of these uh, regulatory differences uh, really uh, can matter. Uh, they certainly matter uh, to uh, those in the private sector. Uh, just as an example, in, in Windsor right now, uh, starting today, uh, October the uh, 2nd, the uh, workers at the Fiat Chrysler assembly plant are on layoff for four weeks or maybe a little longer, at least four weeks, because the 2017 Dodge Caravans that are being uh, produced there uh, don't meet the new U.S. rules for side airbags. The 2018 model will, but apparently they have now produced enough of the 2017 Dodge Caravans for the market in Canada and Mexico, where they can still be sold, but they can't be sold into the U.S. So, no need to keep producing any more 2017 Dodge Caravans. So uh, the workers at the plant are on layoff for four weeks. I don't know if it's everybody at the plant, but that's a huge plant. That's 6,000 workers. Um, so, uh, and the, the new Pacifica will be built there, and it does comply with the new standards. But uh, you can see that these, uh, these standards matter. So they're, they're private sector interests that matter. And uh, if we think of what could happen uh, across Canada if the Como decision stands, if it's just admitted free across Canada, it's, you know, uh, anything province to province is going to be up for grabs, right? Agricultural marketing boards, uh, product standards, labels, um, provincial liquor laws, uh, lots of things will be up for grabs. And uh, those are constitutional rights, so they'll be enforceable by a private citizen, um, just like Mr. Como, who'll be able to say, no, you can't charge me for that. It's unconstitutional, etc. So there are issues here um, about uh, dispute settlement about who gets to be involved in these questions and uh, issues about uh, mechanisms. Before I move on to the European Union, which is a different model, can I clarify anything? We'll get general questions at the end, but if I've been unclear about something, okay, well, whatever it is, then uh, we'll clarify at the end if there are some issues. So. Uh, the European Union has 28 member states, uh, about to be 27 member states, as we all know. Uh, one of the important foundations of the Union is the free movement of goods in the internal market. Uh, within EU institutions, uh, there are um, powerful central institutions that make regulations that apply across the internal market. So there is a centralized force for harmonization, for uh, regulatory um, uh, harmonization. We know that there are harmonized e EU regulations on patents and uh, various other areas. If you study uh, conflicts law, you'll know that there are harmonized regulations on jurisdiction and enforcement of judgments in civil and commercial matters. I bet that's familiar to some of you. So there are a lot of uh, regulations that uh, come from this uh, centralized uh, legislative uh, source uh, within the, uh, the EU. Um, the 
Oh, there we are. Uh, the uh, provision within the uh, European Union uh, that deals with quantitative restrictions and goods uh, not being prohibited entry, et cetera, uh, is this one. In the Treaty on the Functioning of the European Union, it's Article 34, uh, which says quantitative restrictions on imports, and I've underlined all measures having equivalent effect are prohibited between the member states. And then Article 36 says uh, that none of that prohibits uh, prohibitions or restrictions uh, justified on various legitimate objectives, uh, public health, public morality, public policy, public security, health, life of humans, protection of cultural or national treasures, uh, protection of uh, industrial and commercial property, that's patents, trademarks, etc. Uh, so you can see that there are uh, um, provisions here uh, saying that um, uh, entry uh, is to be open except for uh, some of those areas. And the meaning of these provisions has been uh, dealt with in court decisions from the European Court of Justice, uh, giving interpretations of EU law. And just so that everyone understands how this happens, uh, I just need to mention uh, that EU law can have uh, direct application and direct effects on private citizens. Within the, on private interests within the European Union. So private parties can be directly affected by uh, EU law. It can be used in private claims against governments and can also be used in claims private party to private party. Uh, so it's not just uh, member states of the European Union that are making a reference to the European Court of Justice to get uh, an interpretation of EU law. Uh, this could come up in domestic litigation involving private parties or private party against a government. And someone tries to make an argument based on EU law uh, and then the domestic court will be asked to refer a question to the European Court of Justice for interpretation. So the European Court of Justice will receive these references for interpretation of EU law, <coughs> excuse me, and will come up with an interpretation of EU law which goes back to the domestic court and the domestic court applies it uh, to the facts. So here there are strong centralized uh, institutions. There's decision making at the center and there is a judicial function at the center that gives interpretation of EU law that can be used in uh, domestic litigation. So some of the uh, decisions involved here and actually many of the decisions involved here have come from those references from uh, domestic litigation. Uh, there are three cases that are uh, really significant uh, in the interpretation of Articles 34 and 36. Uh, one is the Dassonville uh, decision from 1974. Uh, there was a requirement for a certificate of origin uh, of authentic authenticity uh, for whiskey to be sold in uh, Belgium. And it was easier to get that if you were importing directly from Scotland uh, than if you were uh, importing it from uh, France where it was already in circulation. So uh, the question was whether that was covered by Article 34 and the court said yes. All trading rules capable of hindering directly or indirectly, actually or potentially, intra-community trade are to be considered as measures having an effect 
equivalent to a quantitative restriction actually or potentially uh, affecting or hindering uh, intra-community trade um, are covered by Article 34, so uh, very wide. Uh, and the uh, next significant case is Cassis de Dijon uh, from 1979. Uh, this was liqueur from France that was being imported into Germany and was denied entry because it didn't have enough alcohol in it. The alcohol didn't meet the content requirement in Germany. Now, you can say this seems a little silly, this doesn't make sense, but I mean there was competition here, right? And the expensive part of the liqueur is the alcohol part. So the manufacturers in Germany didn't want to compete with uh, a low-cost uh, import, right? But um, the, the question was uh, whether, in fact, uh, Germany could block uh, importation. And uh, Germany was saying that this was on the basis of health and consumer protection reasons because people would be uh, fooled by the amount of alcohol content and then they'd be drinking too much of the weak stuff and then they'd, they'd move up to the uh, uh, stronger stuff, etc. Uh, but uh, the Cassis de Dijon uh, decision uh, says uh, obstacles to uh, the movement within the community resulting from these differences, these disparities, must be uh, accepted uh, in order to satisfy mandatory requirements uh, relating to the effectiveness of tax supervision, protection of public health, fairness of co commercial transactions, and the defense of the consumer. And if I can just go back, you'll see that like they added to Article 36. In other words, the uh, list of things uh, is not a closed list in Article 36. There are more uh, legitimate objectives. And uh, not surprisingly, the court uh, in Cassis de Dijon uh, found that uh, Germany's rule was a measure equivalent to a quantitative restriction and was not justified. It was incompatible with, uh, uh, with the uh, EU. So those goods had to circulate freely. They had to be given equivalent recognition even though they did not meet the rules in Germany. So that's how recognition of equivalence works. Uh, Keck and Mithuard uh, shows some limits of the coverage, the really wide coverage of uh, Article 34. Uh, this dealt with a prosecution uh, related to um, unfair dealing and, and competition and for sale at less than uh, the purchase price. And I uh, hear the uh, European Court of Justice said that uh, if you've got something that has no uh, real uh, connection to movement of goods, uh, something that is uh, um, really not designed to regulate trade, uh, then Article 34 doesn't apply to it. So here, Article 34 did not apply to a uh, general prohibition on resale at a loss. Uh, so here, uh, national laws uh, that are not such as to hinder trade um, are not covered by Article 34. So we see wide coverage of Article 34, and we see that the importing, the country of import, has to come up with legitimate objectives if it's not going to let the goods in. And I thought I would just give you a few of the, um, a, a few uh, sample decisions. Uh, in uh, 2009, Commission in Italy, this is a uh, uh, case where the European Commission was uh, bringing a claim against Italy uh, because Italy had a prohibition on uh, trailers for mopeds. And um, 
this was found to be a measure equivalent to a quantitative restriction, but Italy's rule was justified by road safety. Uh, in the Aklagaran case, uh, this one is, as you can see, private party to private party. Uh, this one was a rule that uh, prohibited using jet skis uh, except on uh, navigable waterways. <coughs> and the uh, court found uh, that uh, this was also a measure uh, equivalent to a quantitative restriction, but it could be justified by environmental protection if it didn't go beyond what was necessary for uh, the protection of the environment. So this is an interpretation that the European Court of Justice sent down to the domestic court to apply to the facts. A uh, case in 2010 against France uh, requiring a prior authorization for various supplements added to food uh, and France lost that one. It, it uh, couldn't uh, uh, present enough of a justification of health protection to, uh, uh, to uh, uh, say that that uh, measure would be accepted. Kerr Optica in 2010, uh, selling uh, contact lenses by the internet. Um, when uh, the country of import tried to prohibit that, it was found to be a measure equivalent to a quantitative restriction, and uh, that uh, prohibition was not justified by health protection, so contact lenses could be sold by the internet. Uh, a case against Austria in 2010, uh, a rule in Austria saying that uh, uh, any blood products for transfusion had to be from entirely voluntary blood donations. Once again, a measure equivalent to a quantitative restriction not justified by health protection. Uh, 2015, uh, Visnapu, um, this was uh, a question of a requirement of a license for retail sale of uh, alcoholic beverages uh, from another member state. Uh, this was a rule in Finland. Uh, and uh, this is a, uh, uh, an interesting situation where uh, Mr. Visnapu uh, was in Estonia and uh, was running a service uh, through the internet called uh, um, Alco Taxi. And in order to get around the requirements uh, controlling retail sale in Finland, um, here Mr. Visnapu would uh, buy the stuff in Estonia and then just drive it in, you know, call the Alco taxi, right? Uh, and, and he was prosecuted for evading excise duties and, you know, there were lots of issues here. But he was using um, Article 34 in his defense. It uh, might work. Uh, it was doubtful that, in fact, uh, Finland <coughs> excuse me, would be able to um, uh, justify its measure uh, on, uh, in accordance with the protection of health and public uh, policy. Uh, the restriction of uh, domestic sales simply to uh, the uh, permitted uh, retailers for, for health reasons. Uh, the argument was that if you want to control uh, alcoholism, you can, you can put taxes on rather than uh, controlling the retailer. But in any case, uh, this was something that the European Court of Justice, again, would leave to the domestic court to decide. This requirement of having a license for retail sales uh, in Finland was a measure equivalent to a quantitative restriction. Uh, it might be justified by the protection of health and public policy. More recent decision, uh, just this past spring, 
uh, Noria and uh, the prosecutor in France, um, a prohibition on food supplements that circulated elsewhere and had vitamin and mineral content higher than the limits in France. And it was found that that prohibition was also uh, a measure equivalent to a quantitative restriction. One of the problems was that it did not provide a procedure for recognition that would be readily accessible and could be completed in a reasonable time. So you can see the procedural demands on the country of uh, import here. It's not just that France was saying you can only have these food supplements, but France was not allowing for a recognition procedure for things uh, in circulation elsewhere uh, in the European Union. So that was a measure equivalent to a quantitative restriction and was not justified. In the common market model then, uh, for these questions of recognition of equivalence, uh, you can see that this is quite different from uh, the situation uh, in NAFTA. Uh, in the common market model, uh, the burden is on the host state to justify if it refuses, and you can see the involvement of private parties. The private party can initiate, can control. Uh, just to make sure that we have some time for discussion. Uh, I'm going to move uh, relatively quickly through uh, the Canadian Free Trade Agreement, um, which I call the uh, regulatory model. Uh, this is the agreement uh, that uh, took effect this past uh, July. It replaces the agreement on internal trade, uh, which went into effect in 1995. It is a political agreement. <coughs> uh, it is said to respect legislative competences of the provincial, territorial, and federal governments. Uh, it deals with mobility for goods, services, investments, and labor. Uh, there is dispute settlement set up under it. Some of the dispute settlement is government to government, provinces against each other, provinces against federal government, et cetera, uh, which has uh, dispute settlement panels, and there's an appeal level as well, and there is a possibility of getting a monetary order through that dispute settlement system. There is also dispute settlement that is private party, that is person to government. If a government is not abiding by what it has agreed to under the Canadian Free Trade Agreement, then a person can initiate dispute settlement against government, goes to a panel, same uh, structure can go on appeal, so there's a second level, and there can be a monetary order. Uh, and the monetary orders get enforced in court, there's a, a system set up. Um, on uh, regulatory uh, cooperation, the Canadian Free Trade Agreement doesn't use the, the same models that we've been looking at. Uh, it, it has national treatment, that's, that's standard, uh, but it doesn't use, regula or doesn't use recognition of equivalence. What it does, however, is set up a, a special chapter on regulatory cooperation with this uh, regulatory reconciliation and cooperation table. And under the operation of this committee, this, this table, uh, the governments will work to reduce barriers to trade investment and labor mobility. Uh, from chapter four, uh, this, uh, this RCT chapter, uh, there's uh, no uh, dispute settlement access. You can have dispute settlement under uh, agreements that are, are set up specifically, but there's no uh, person to government in particular, dispute settlement access. And chapter four doesn't apply at the municipal levels. But if you get 
from this process a reconciliation agreement. Uh, it could be harmonization, it could be mutual recognition, or it could be e equivalence that is agreed on. So that reconciliation could uh, relate to a number of things. So if you get a reconciliation agreement through this RCT process, um, my question is, what happens after that? Because this is just a political um, agreement, right? And um, the, the one case that I find really interesting on this question of what happens from the Canadian Free Trade Agreement uh, is a decision of the uh, Alberta Court, Court of Appeal in 2016 uh, in which a uh, dentist is contesting his uh, lack of uh, registration for Alberta. He's a dentist in British Columbia. There are some complaints uh, that have been dealt with in British Columbia against him. Uh, Twenty of them, I think, had been settled, two outstanding. But at that point, he applies to be registered in uh, Alberta. And his registration is denied uh, for failure to show evidence of good character and reputation. I, he argues you can't do that because the uh, mobility agreement between Alberta and BC under the previous agreement on internal trade, you could have separate agreements that went further than the uh, agreement on internal trade. Uh, his lawyer argues uh, that the uh, mobility agreement under TILMA uh, says that uh, certification should be automatic. It should automatically allow him to qualify to practice in Alberta. And that uh, provision uh, is not part of the Alberta legislation. Now, how is the court supposed to deal with that? How is the, co how is the court supposed to deal with these, these things that are just political agreements? Well. Uh, the uh, court really didn't know what to do and um, was persuaded that it should use the approach that we use to deal with public international law, which is uh, really not what this is. But the court used the uh, assumption that uh, countries uh, will uphold their international agreements and court, the, the court used this presumption that a, a government would abide by it, its agreements if there was ambiguity in the uh, domestic legislation. But then the court said, well, that doesn't apply here because there's no ambiguity in the domestic legislation. For us, the Alberta legislation is very clear. The regulation says that if you're going to be uh, registered you have to show good character and uh, reputation. So that's one way of dealing with the Canadian Free Trade Agreement and things that come from it. But it's kind of hard to assume that that's going to be the only way. Like, why should there be a presumption in favor of that agreement? It's just a political agreement. So um, in order to... Uh, uh, think of this in context, uh, I took the, an example of um, a fight that has uh, uh, occupied uh, some time under the agreement on internal trade, uh, the, the one that's been in place, since, was in place since 1995. Uh, the question of uh, labels for dairy product substitutes, whether they can be called milk or cheese, like soy milk, soy cheese, etc. There have been disputes among the uh, provinces about that. But if we assume there is some kind of uh, reconciliation agreement under uh, this uh, reconciliation uh, table, through the Canadian Free Trade Agreement, uh, and then assume that a dissenting province fails to bring that into its uh, regulation, um, 
is there in fact a remedy? Like you can't, is there judicial review? Um, how do you do that? Um, should this be seen simply as persuasive authority? Just information that's given to the court that might persuade a court? And um, if the Como case is affirmed, if the Como decision is affirmed, um, what would happen there? Is there any provincial control? Or should there be um, controls uh, that would say goods circulate unless the province of uh, import uh, can justify a restriction? Or does the province of export have to make the case that legitimate objectives have been met? Um, if we're thinking of the various possibilities of what might happen uh, in the Como decision, it seems to me that it could be helpful for the lawyers involved to review some of this material on recognition of equivalence, how things operate country to country, how things operate within the constituent parts of an overall market, how things might operate uh, province to province in Canada. So there are issues then about burdens of proof, issues about procedures, uh, issues about um, who gets to bring these complaints, uh, who gets to make the arguments. All of this goes along with sovereignty and the difficulty of uh, regulating, uh, the difficulty of regulating across borders. This is interprovincial, this is international. There's also potentially another uh, border involved in the uh, Como case as well, uh, because uh, Mr. Como didn't buy uh, all of his uh, purchasers in Quebec from the uh, Société d'Alcool, from the uh, Quebec Provincial Liquor Authority. Uh, a few of the cases of, of beer were from a vendor on the Listagooch First Nation Reserve, just across from uh, Campbellton, uh, New Brunswick as well. So there are more borders uh, involved. Um, I don't have answers to this, but uh, what I'm suggesting is that regulatory cooperation is inevitable, given the tendency for facts and life in general to spill across borders. Uh, and it's uh, difficult. There are unavoidable challenges. But it seems to me that there are things that uh, international trade has to offer to the question of commerce and beer across Canada. I thank you for your attention and I look forward to your comments.